we meet in unusual times. <laughs> we do. So, all right, so I've been very impressed, as usual, by your writing on this. And as you know, I've been tweeting it out and big, giving it a big thumbs up. I want to start off with the piece you wrote in Foreign Policy, which was one of those pieces which really made me sit up and pay attention because, in a sense, you pointed out something bloody obvious that, if you thought about it for five minutes, was bloody obvious and no one was really picking it up. And that is essentially that we really are in unprecedented territory. There is no mean reversion to a sense of normality that we really understand coming down the road from this. What brought you to that conclusion and walk us through why you got to that conclusion? It was the unemployment numbers, there's no doubt. I mean, that string, and we're still in the middle of it, presumably, of numbers that just, well, they just bust the charts, you map them logarithmically, it's still a right angle. We've never never even seen anything remotely like it. It's order of magnitude worse than anything in the previous economic record. And as a historian, I'm really impatient with folks in my discipline who are continuously trying to insist that, you know, you know, hold the horses, calm down, whatever's happening in the present has got some deep historical antecedent. We've seen it all before. And there are moments when that's just clearly not true. I guess I was primed anyway, because I'm a, you know, increasingly a climate change guy. And in the climate change discussion, the hockey stick, you know, the, the dramatic acceleration of growth and change since 1945 is, you know, what that starts from that debate, really, I think the serious debate. And what I was looking for was that kind of discontinuity in that moment. So it was the unemployment numbers that did it. I mean, you know, now that this week we've had negative oil. Um, right. But that's a little bit more of a freakish technical result. But the unemployment numbers are bona fide. We're just seeing yeah. a collective shutdown. And then the ILO put this figure out recently. 2.7 billion people worldwide, 81% of the global workforce, under one or other type of restriction. We have just never, ever seen anything quite like that before. And, then, you know, sometimes it's the job of the historian, I think, you know, to, to say that, that according to our, you know, what our understanding of previous history, there's nothing being like that. So then, of course, the question is what follows? How does one navigate in terrain like that? And in a sense, then you do end up recurring to standard, more standard thinking about modernity, because after all, you know, the, the one way of looking at modern history is that it's an endless series of breaks like this. Just some are more radical than others. And the ones we're living through right now are particularly so. And so you end up with this trope of radical uncertainty as one of the kind of mm -hmm. historical conditions that we live in in modernity. And that poses fundamental problems for rational decision making, um, whether you think of that in terms of you know, a narrow calculus of cost benefits, rational choice, or just more generally, how do we orientate ourselves to reality? That becomes mm -hmm. an absolutely fundamental concern. And in a quaint now quaint seeming kind of way. We were posing that question last year, you know, because of the geopolitical compass with China. But all of a sudden, it's taken on a, you know, dimensions that we hadn't, like you're saying, like the beginning of this year, no one, no one would have imagined that we would be in this moment. So maybe one way of thinking about it is in the way that we, we need to change the way that we think about institutions. So let's think about an economy as a series of particular institutions constructed at a particular historical moment. And what is it that all these institutions do, whether they are even beyond economic institutions, let's think social institutions, everything from bar mitzvahs to bond markets, right? What they do is set down rules and basically help us to reduce the uncertainty which is there all the time. In a sense, what we do as humans is construct social institutions that allow us to some way control the uncertainty that is the essential part of our lives. And what this shock seems to have done, I'm not even sure if we should call it a shock, is to basically demand that we think about if it's possible to tame that uncertainty with the institutions we have. I'll just get one very simple example of this. In the United States, as you know, there's the figure that gets quoted all the time in the media, because it's true, that 40% of Americans would have trouble getting 400 bucks together for an emergency. Well, the emergency started a month ago, so they've blown through that, those 400 bucks. And a lot of the anti-lockdown protests is absolutely legitimately anger over the fact of this sort of economic chasm that we call an economy. But the paradox, of course, is even if you open it all up tomorrow, are you going to go back to a restaurant? Is that the first thing on your mind? Are you going to go to a shopping mall where you can literally shop till you drop? Our behavioral response has got to be changed coming out of this, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the real puzzles for thinking about the whole process, because if you look back, I've been looking back, scanning back recently over the auto industry shutdown 
I mean, organized labor was a key driver of the shutdown in, in, in the auto sector globally in Europe mm -hmm. and in the United States. And it's, you know, we think of it now as a difficult decision made by politicians and ultimately they have to make decisions. But I think we really have to think of that as ratifying decisions that were being made by very powerful collective actors on the one hand and also by individuals. And in a sense, what politics comes along afterwards and says, you see it in the school strike in New York as well. Effectively, p teachers were calling in sick and parents weren't sending their kids to school and the schools were becoming increasingly dysfunctional. And so the question mm -hmm. is, when does politics sign off on the fact that, yes, this is in fact a national shutdown? And to that extent, likewise, the exit from this period of uncertainty can't simply be a matter of government fiat either. It needs to be a series of procedures, a series of practices and expectations that we all feel comfortable with. And that has to start in the hospital sector. I mean, the, the most fundamental one of these, I think, to take up your analogy, is basically the mechanisms and institutions and expectations we have about dying. And in a sense, the thing that drove this entire crisis after all was not the deaths per se, or even, you know, a horrendously high probability of dying, because neither of those two things are all that remarkable about this disease. It's the sense that it completely overwhelmed the mechanisms that we have for dealing with that ultimate existential uncertainty is, you know, how do I pop off? How does this end? Yeah. And it's supposed to end in an orderly fashion with known diseases in settings that we're broadly speaking familiar with, which don't look like some sort of hellish charnel house, right, that look like a conventional hospital ward. And each one of those moments is going to be terrible for those involved, but it isn't going to be a collective nightmare. And what COVID-19 did was to disrupt that. So I think from, from my point of view, as it were, an orderly restoration of the mechanism of our regular dying is where it all has to, that's where it has to start from. Once mm -hmm. that's in place, you know, once I know that my chances of getting seriously sick are X, but then I've got a very good chance of getting intensive care bed. And then, you know, if I really need it, a ventilator, ultimately, I'll feel better about going back to going to a you, restaurant. You go to the again. restaurant. That's it. Exactly. At that point. It's hilarious. But you know, right. I never previously thought about it. But it was, of course, literally true. And as a European traveling to the US, this is true, right? You're very ill-advised to visit the United States unless you can get bomb-proof, gold-plated travelers' health insurance. Because if you yes. were en route to a restaurant from your hotel to absentmindedly step into the street and get run over, you could be bankrupt the next yes. second, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that existential risk, risk and its financial implications are there. But we, as you're saying, we have all of these conventional mechanisms for managing that. And this virus has disrupted those. And until we've got those back, Right. It, indeed, like the government, you know, the politicians can wave their hands as much as they like and the economy won't restart or well, bits of it won't. I mean, certain right. bits of it will. But, but the, the, you know, the, the touchy feely, the soft tissue of the service sector, that will all remain dead, I think. So in light of those comments, I'm reminded once again of how Nassim Taleb is actually a lot more correct about stuff than most of us like to admit in the following sense. One of the things that he wrote about in Antifragility was nature always has redundancies. Nature never optimizes. And what we've been doing, whether it's through globalization, whether it's through measuring healthcare efficiency by the lack of ICU beds in use, we've optimized everything. And we see this all over the economy. There was a, a thing that I tweeted out, which was the cash flow dependence of businesses. So basically, the, the median sort of cash store is 15 days because we are used to having just-in-time access to liquidity. We basically make a bet on infinite liquidity. It's like 2008 all over again. Do you think that we're going to start thinking about redundancies when we retreat these institutions? Or are we going to go for this building the same type of vulnerabilities again? I think that, that, seems, that seems spot on. And we've seen it all the way through the system, right? I mean, the, the freak out in the oil market this week was to do with the fact that there isn't that much redundant oil storage capacity. And those trades which generated the crash in oil prices are basically based on non-oil interested investors who buy mm -hmm. oil proxies on the confident expectation that at the end of every month they could roll them over on the assumption that there's always a buyer, on the assumption that there's storage there if you need it. And all of that turned out not to be true because as you're saying, it would be inefficient to maintain that degree of redundancy, that degree of, of backstop. I mean, one area where so far, at least you could say we have learned that lesson already is in sense in bank regulation. I mean, they do not seem this time around to be 
the problem. That's at least yes. an optimistic mainstream yeah, yeah. view. And we may see trouble coming down the pike, but so far, so good anyway. And mm -hmm. that does have to do with the fact that to their immense frustration, they are being forced not to do things that they would far rather do. Like have big capital buffers, exactly. Have ex you know, with the, exactly. And, they're, and, they're, and they're, the liquidity requirements we've put in place really did drive them out of all sorts of market making. Mm -hmm. And they will then, of course, in a micro sense, well, say, well, if only we'd been there, if only JP Morgan had been able to make markets for treasuries in those crucial second and third week of March, you would not have had the trouble. But would any of us really want to take the risk on that? Yeah, and maybe exactly. not on JP Morgan, but on some JP Morgan knockoff that's worse at the job than they are, and then ends up as a Lehman. Like, yeah. So in a sense, we did de-risk that element by following precisely the, argue, the logic that, you, that you've suggested, which is, yes, let's have some buffers. Let's have some, let's have mm -hmm. some short run inefficiency here to be able to deal with the unpredictable. I mean, in this case, I think, you know, whether or not the epidemic really is a black swan in the classic sense, I think it's more to my mind, a sort of mental disconnect. There were plenty of people saying that this was actually a very substantial risk. Anyone you talk to in the British civil service will tell you it was like, you know, top three nightmarish risks yeah. for as long as they've been making the famous lists of their ultimate nightmares. But no one ever connected it up, unlike with terrorism, which for the point of view of the British civil service is bread and butter nowadays. Mm -hmm. Pandemics were like, well, obviously, yeah. but a bit science fiction. Um, and that'll change, clearly, in the wake of this. So let's talk about the Fed, because when I grab your book off the shelf from last year, the Fed is the dominant actor. The Fed seems to be the dominant actor again. The Fed is basically the global central bank. And when all of this was kicking off, I was reminded of a discussion, I think, that we had at one point, whether if there was another big crisis, would the Fed be able to do what it did last time? Because the politics have changed and the politics have changed, but they've done even more. So how do you think about that? I think that's one of the real puzzles. And it wasn't just us having that conversation. I can tell you that like some, and I'm sure you've had the same experience, some extremely highly placed people in institutions like the IMF were having that conversation mm -hmm. and would ask me in a kind of open-eyed way, well, does this imply that? Do you Could you imagine getting this done with the GOP? I, I think the short answer, and this may be like the simplistic answer, but nevertheless, it may be the most correct answer, is it really depends whose president is in the White House. Like, if you have yeah. a Republican president in the White House, the GOP is a very different beast. And I would expect all sorts of trouble to kick off as, you know, if and when Joe Biden is elected. I think the whole thing may tip. Um, mm. Whilst there's a Republican, I mean, I know this is a crude explanation, but I think no, it no, no, may no. explain most of what's going on is that the GOP is a ruthlessly cynical political actor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a year like this, where they think they've got a president who has a fighting chance of getting reelected, unlike Bush in 2008, when the party's actually sort of battered itself into compliance with the Trump team, when you've got somebody like Mnuchin who appears to be doing a reasonable job of squaring the circles on Congress and pulling in Pelosi and co from the Democrats, in fact, they're not gonna they're not gonna kick up a fuss. And the internationalism is kind of is internationalism light? It's technocratic. It doesn't appear to be an issue. I, I mean, I had a bit of a wobble, I must admit when I heard that Erdogan of Turkey had explicitly raised the issue of swap lines, which would be the backdoor mechanisms through which the, said, the Fed is doing this lender of last resort to their substantial banks. And he apparently raised it in a phone call with Trump. And, you know, there are two things that are worrying about that. A, Erdogan knows, well, three, yeah, yeah. Erdogan knows about swaps. Trump knows about swaps. And Trump knows Erdogan wants a swap. And that, you know, right. if there's a configuration more <laughs> likely to produce a blow up than that, it's pretty... It's pretty hard to imagine. I mean, I had another theory, which is that they just, the folks, you know, around Trump just didn't know. And right. That's not, that's not true. Um, I mean, but, but let me, let me now, throw this one out here. Yeah. Let me throw this one at you, though, because here's the puzzle I have thinking about this. When I think about the Trump administration in terms of trade, I think about basically arguing over bilateral trade deficits. And you and I both fall into the camp that it's really about global patterns of saving and investment, and it doesn't actually mean that much. And in fact, it's a show of strength rather than the weakness, et cetera, et cetera. Nonetheless, they seem to sincerely hold this point of view. And if you do hold that point of view, then doing swaps should annoy you. Mm -hmm. But, but it, they're kind of letting it go. Now, is it because, in a sense, let's flip that around, are they really just cynical on the whole trade thing? Do they really actually understand the picture a lot more than we think. 
and the, the, this is just a way of pissing off China and doing various like foreign policy goals. But they actually do get the plumbing. They do get the architecture. They do understand not just the exorbitant privilege, but the fact that the Fed is the global central bank. And if you do get that, you're kind of the top dog, right? It's good to be the king. Why would you screw with that? Well, I mean, another way of, of sort of squaring this circles, I, I mean, I agree, it's a fundamental puzzle. I mean, Gillian Tett wrote a great essay about this, like this question of the compatibility of a populist nationalism with an international global hegemonic right. role is a, is a fundamental one. And it's a fundamental one all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century in you know the aftermath of World War One. The same problem arises. And part of the answer may simply be that one of the way that power operates is it's incoherent. All the dots don't mm. need to join up. One of the ways in which you do this is that you disaggregate the different functions of the state and politics, and they operate in different spheres. And so it, then the coherence is, as it were, the matter A in the intellectual's head of like how these things fit together, and B, whether or not certain political actors decide through political entrepreneurship to basket things together and say, look, this means that and so. But right. if you were looking for strands of coherence, I mean, couldn't you broadly say that Trump's been pretty consistent in not wanting a strong dollar? And one of the ways in which you avoid the dollar strengthening is to pump dollar liquidity out into the global system to prevent what appeared to be going on, especially around the 18th of March, which I think is going mm -hmm. to go down in history as like the absolute high point of financial tension in March this year. The big foreign exchange market in London was all one way, and it can't work mm -hmm. like that. You know, Everyone just wanted to sell everything and buy dollars. Right. And in a sense, what the Fed's policy was is designed to do is to find every conceivable way possible of gently easing that pressure off and avoiding right. a spike in the dollar. And there's nothing that will be, you know, from the point of view of that kind of mercantilist trade view, that that kind of fits, right? You want to yeah, leave the fit. dollar, you don't want a strong dollar. So that that might be part of the way in which this works. How right. it fits with the geopolitical dimension, you know, the way in which last year we were so worried about trade issues shading into something much nastier. Yes. Um, and that I think we still haven't worked out. And, you know, this repo facility that the Fed has set up where they allow foreign central banks to borrow, borrow against treasuries they hold as collateral, the advantage of that is the foreign central bank doesn't have to sell the treasury, which is the what the Fed really wanted to prevent from happening, because Fed March, the several of those weeks were really dodgy yeah. even in the treasury market. But on the other hand, that implies a degree of cooperation between the central banks, you know, and partnership, if you like, which really doesn't fit all that well from the point of view of antagonistic you know, right. a relationship. When when we're I, in the Huawei yeah. world, then then it that that seems to me yes. to be almost more at odds. Um, with the Fed's role. Well, just to build on that then, I mean, if we think about it, and let's, let's be gross and aggregate again. So the United States growth model, if you will, even though it's large and disaggregated, is basically consumption driven. And we do deficits. And the German, Northern European, Eastern European and Chinese growth models, even though China's export platform, this has much declined in the 10 years, uh, is still quite export heavy they rely on accumulating dollar claims and then not intermediating them in the domestic banking system and essentially giving them back to us. That kind of circular flow of dollars is what the entire system depends upon. So you don't even have to invoke enlightened self-interest in this one because ultimately Chinese and German firms earning dollars and then dumping them in their local banks, forcing their banks to find a corresponding asset keeps the whole thing going. The Treasury just needs to sit and play the regulator on this whole thing. And that kind of implies that the politics, in a sense, it's not that it doesn't matter, but it matters less than perhaps we think. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great view. And I mean, the other element they need to then do is hedge a little bit currency risk, because that strategy involves you basically in accepting, uh, accepting foreign exchange loss if you expect the dollar basically to dribble down. Right. And that then can produce eddying effects where people have got big dollar hedges. Mm -hmm. um, and if the dollar then suddenly reverses, which is what we've seen periodically, like if you've got a bunch of people who are basically heavily hedged against the dollar depreciation, and then suddenly a panic builds up and the dollar surges, and, mm -hmm. that can cause real ructions. Um, so, but otherwise, I agree. There's a sort of hydraulic quality to this, um, which shouldn't be, you know, we should not be underestimated, and we shouldn't over, we shouldn't just take the news conferences. You know, right. as at face value, um, they, they, those news conferences have a functional significance. They matter very, very crucially for the reproduction of Trump's politics. 
But that doesn't necessarily connect in a direct way to these sort of issues of macroeconomic governance that you're talking about. Exactly. So let's stay with the Fed just for a minute. Uh, they're doing much more than we thought possible. Um, even, the, even the Republicans have discovered direct monetary financing on the Treasury side, but let's leave that to one thing. Is there anything that the Fed has done or is doing which has genuinely surprised you and made you go, hang on a minute, what's that? Well, it depends. I mean, I guess it's expanded our envelope. After 2008 and we thought of the Fed, as you were saying, as a very activist actor. I mean, what we've seen now is just the disinhibited kind of willingness to take you know, pretty much, pretty much anything, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so they they bought corporate debt, and, they, right. and then they're, they're then buying they junk bonds, exactly. And then they and then they had to sort of draw a line around that and say, well, it was going to be only investment grade. And then, of course, you create trouble on the line. So then it was grandfathered in stuff, which isn't investment grade anymore, but was investment grade, I think, on the twenty second of March or something, right? And then. And then it turns out they will buy high yield, but by way of the ETFs rather than the underlying assets. And I don't expect that to stop. I mean, I think that's the thing yeah. that's been really surprising is just the utterly pragmatic nature of the Powell Fed. Um, that's really, you know, is it ultimately surprising if you take the view that the Fed is in the end this comprehensive lender of last resort? Yeah. Um, it, you know, then it shouldn't be surprising, but you kind of think there were kind of shame boundaries, you know, there were, there yes. were, there were the kind of taboos that, that the Fed would not want to, not want to violate. And uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but isn't there a, <laughs> isn't there a like danger? Right now. Yeah. Isn't there a danger in this though? I mean, let's do one version of the story which you've heard before. So the Fed has basically, since the Greenspan era, engaged in asset protection through a series of puts. And this is just the latest example of the biggest put of all time. And the Fed finds itself in a position that it is guaranteeing or putting a floor, if you will, under asset prices. And, you know, that's not the job of the Fed. And when you basically have negative real longs, and that's going on for as far as you can see, and there seems to be no sign of inflation, and if it's not in this coronavirus moment, growth seems to be ticking along reasonably well. I'm thinking of the Blanchard piece at the end of 2019, right? You're incentivizing a lot of bad corporate behavior, like the issue of debt and buybacks and all this sort of stuff, right? No, I know. You're sounding like a neoliberal. <laughs> I know, I know, but, but just follow like me on this one, right? A proper, a prop, a neo, exactly, a real yeah, one, right? So you incentivize all this bad behavior, right? And then what you do is you buy it. I mean, you know, there is a, there is a kind of moral hazard problem here, which we do have to face up to at some point, surely, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the ones, the, the stories that have blown my mind have been that one where the mortgage lenders knew they were going to face risk. So what they did was they shorted mortgage-backed securities because those would collapse. And then it turned out the Fed intervened so quickly that that they, they never collapsed. So their shorts all went bad. <laughs> so then they needed peeling out to protect them from the, from, from their own the shorts. shorts. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. These, yeah. Have you got these distressed um, debt merchants who are all over Bloomberg complaining about the fact there isn't enough distressed debt for them to buy because the Fed is doing too good a job? Right, in, exactly. You know, eliminating... I mean, yes. I mean, these are are these the morbid symptoms of a system, you know, in some sort of transition to, you know, to invoke the over invoked Gramscian phrase. I mean, you could you could claim that. I, I, I'm really much more of the sort of, you know, build your boat at sea, ramshackle sort of, you know, whatever it is, Mad Max, build mm -hmm. your crazy highly mobile, dangerous contraction of capitalism, both at the national and global level as you go along. What, I mean, in a sense, what else do we expect? If you were to rewrite the econ textbooks for this period, I imagine you just wrote the first ever econ textbook right now. Would you say that, you know, the part of the role of the state is to produce a floor for aggregate demand? You might want to just say, we don't really do that anymore. What we care about is asset prices and basically central banks pop up asset prices. Would that actually be a fair characterization? Because if we right. switch, it, switch it to Europe in particular, right? The whole debate over corona bonds and basically off balance sheet spending to allow greater macroeconomic impact. It seems to be now nah, the ECB is kind of like a shit version of the Fed. They'll do some guaranteeing of a floor for prices and then you're on your own. That's pretty much it. And the consequences of that are in a, you know, a union, which in some senses, if you take the whole Eurozone comparable to to the United States 
pretty lamentable from a political point of view. It doesn't work that well, right? I mean, if your choice is between that version of capitalist governance and the American version, I think you're, the the answer is which one you pick is pretty evident, right? The sustaining aggregate demand is an important function and divvying it up across the complex, highly divided zone of the Eurozone is something that Eurozone economic governance fails at. because you, And the symbol of that is the stagnation of the Italian economy. So let's focus in on Europe. Um, you just mentioned the Italian economy uh, being deeply problematic and in a sense uh, impacted by bad Eurozone governance for the past 20 years by some readings. Uh, are the Italians off? Is this the breaking point or is it just going to continue as it did through the crisis as it did last time? My my sense is this is the very unhappy version of the Mad Max improvised capitalist governance. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very unhappy marriage. It's a very unhappy dysfunctional machine. I'm not sure that it breaks off because, I mean, even with Greece, I was pretty persuaded that the costs of a Grexit were exorbitant mm -hmm. for a country the size of Greece, for an an economy with the sophistication of Italy, with the balance sheets of the Italian financial system denominated in euros, it would need some wizardry of financial engineering to get them out of there without a complete meltdown, which, given the weaknesses of the Italian economy right now, is the absolutely last thing they need. So I don't think, you know, an Italian exit from the euro is even a remotely plausible politics. And I mean, certainly in the previous iteration, the last time that the euro skeptic ran hot in Italy, when it actually came to it, they backed away from that. Yeah. Furthermore, the powers that be in Italy intervened quite heavily to ensure that, as it were, whatever government arrived was one that they thought they could work with. I find, think it's very unlikely that Italy will crash out, but I think what it means is that we continue on in an increasingly unhappy way. But does that mean the politics get worse? So if we're currently looking at 30% unemployment in, these econ in, our, in all economies generally. You can imagine the Italians being in even worse shape. I mean, this is a catastrophe. If the sort of the demands for the Schwarze Null, for the Black Zero come back at that point, and demands for another round of austerity, which seems likely to actually happen, and that will be catastrophic politically for these most affected economies, surely. Yeah, I mean, I think Jens Weidmann may win the prize, if not the prize, at least the runner-up prize for the first announcement of that politics. So the head of the German Bundesbank has already said, OK, fine, spend now, but you know we're going to have to do consolidation later. And that is a catastrophe because Italy's debt to GDP ratio will be up in the 150s by that point. So really, there isn't any realistic alternative but to park that on the ECB's balance sheet and leave it there, short of some imaginative European federal fiscal fix, which no one seems to have any appetite for. There is a catastrophic uh, 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 politics of austerity that could lurk down the road, and that would, um, I agree, I mean, it, I, I'm, the, political, the political fallout from that could be, could be ruinous. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to Britain for a moment. Boris becomes the spendthrift, even though he went in and out of a corona ward. Uh, he fires his chancellor because he's basically an Austerian and puts in someone that gets bullied around by Dominic Cummings. They've discovered helicopter money. They're doing 80% replacement on wages. They've even got programs to help the self-employed. Are you as utterly freaked out by this as I am? I mean, it's, um, it's very difficult to locate politically, I agree. I mean, that's the thing, because you sort of, you know, as a leftish observer from the outside, you keep thinking, well, you know, I should be making constructive suggestions. And then you realize who you're making them to. And they are, right. this is a conservative government. Um, and the, the question, I think, for me is going to be, where are the constraints? I mean, so, so is being an advanced economy in, as it were, the mind map of global investors, a permanent thing that is, as mm. it were, attached to the brand of UK? Or to the undoubted, you know, technical competence of the people who run that machine. I mean, the people in the Treasury and the Bank of England, they know their business. Yeah. Um, or is it actually attached to the macroeconomic fundamentals in the way that we used to think it was? And I mean, the whole lesson, really, for the advanced economy group, and that, in a sense, is a circular self-definition for a group of countries since the late 1990s, is that many of the constraints that we thought existed and that history told us did exist, Mm -hmm. even for them, no longer really applied in quite the way that we thought they did, unless you constructed, you know, fiendish, devilish machines of discipline like the Eurozone, which somehow mm -hmm. managed to reimpose on an actor like Italy, 
the constraints which an actor like the UK doesn't seem to operate under. And that's, exactly. I mean, it's really, because you would expect, history would tell you, that sterling should plunge in some uncontrollable yep. kind of way. And the Treasury, the UK gilt market, the Treasury market should sell off. And whether the government liked it or not, interest rates would surge. And this would be the story of the 1950s, the 60s and the 70s, right? Absolutely. And that constraint just doesn't... It just doesn't seem to be there. There was one moment, I think, there was this uh, great uh, Chris Giles report in the Financial Times the day after, so March 19th. And through that darkly, I mean, I'm not a market participant, you know, I'm not in the inside yeah. of the Bank of England or the Treasury or on Canary Wharf. But through that, it seems to me you could glimpse something pretty terrifying was going on on March 18th in the London market. So, I mean, something mm -hmm. that scared the bejesus out of the people in the Bank of England. They were, they saw, I mean, the pound fell by 5% against the dollar yeah. that day. And they saw very weird behavior in the gilts markets. They saw prices going up and down, and they saw gapping between different runs of gilts, which ought to trade on a smooth curve, and they weren't anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that, for them, was a sort of vertiginous moment where they realized, oh, shit, you know, this right. really could go south, and it could go south fast. But the response, what's the response? Essentially, huge QE. And yeah. then the following week, um, you know, something they're now vigorously denying is direct monetary finance, but is basically a huge overdraft on the British yes. government's ways and knees account at the behest of the Treasury. I mean, it clearly wasn't the Bank of England that took the initiative. So I, I got a little bit of it. You probably know this, but I got a bit of insider gossip on this because I was talking to someone who has bank connections asking about this overdraft. Apparently, it's been around since the 40s, and apparently it's been operative the whole time. And at some point, at some points during the 1980s, that overdraft was equivalent, according to my source, of 60% of the money supply. It's bloody huge. Yeah, I know it right? isn't. I mean, it goes up and down, right? Yeah. And, you know, but yeah. but some, at some points, I mean, so effectively, they've always been doing this. It's just a very sort of odd. Nobody's saying anything about it. Yeah, there's something wrong with our standard accounts of um, the way in which the balance between direct financing and the bond market and then the indirect mechanisms in which you nevertheless provide money to the government by way of buying bonds right. out of the bond market. There's something wrong with our account and our basic stylized facts are not quite right. Until the 90s, I think almost all central banks essentially took direct monetary financing for granted. Yeah. And then, as it were, the doctrine of central bank independence and a kind of stylized version of the Bundesbank model imposed mm -hmm. themselves as the thing that everyone did. And that includes, in the case of the ECB, an explicit prohibition of direct monetary financing. But as you're saying, almost all the actual, you know, genuine national central banks have as this sort of appendix, this, you know, emergency button that you can press if yeah. you absolutely have to. And they did it in 2008. I mean, they ran up a couple of 10 billion pounds worth of financing mm -hmm. that way. And after all, you know, you don't have to be an MMT person to just understand that this is just the hydraulics, essentially, of the national balance sheet being worked a slightly different way. And all right. they're really doing, and I believe them, is basically saying, look, we don't want to stress the gilt market right now. It just doesn't seem like a good idea. So we'll run up this ways and means account. We think there's zero risk of inflation. So there's yeah. really no problem in doing this. And what we'll do later on is run an oversized bond campaign, raise mm -hmm. the money that we need, suck it back out of suck the market, it back, and right. pay down and pay down this. So that's all it is, folks. Yeah, you know, that's it. Yeah, which, which is the one side of the coin, uh -huh. and the other one is yes, and it's a complete violation of all the taboos of the 1990s, isn't it? To which the answer yeah. is yes, it is also yes, that. It is. It <laughs> is also that. So, so are we in a high road to Weimar? No, like you know, no, absolutely. Never was. And so, exactly, it never was. So it never was. Let's, let's push it even further then. Does it make sense anymore to talk about fiscal policy and monetary policy as two separate spheres, as the classic central bank model also demands? Or is that just completely gone as well? That's clearly up for grabs in the same way. I mean, to a historian, this is delicious because all that's telling you is that all of these institutions clearly have genealogies, you know, that, that are constructed in the course of the 20th century. I mean, at the end of the 19th century, there wasn't anything that we would really currently understand as economic policy at all. There was neither fiscal right. nor monetary policy in the modern sense, right? Because there was no conception of the macroeconomy to attach those to. There was fiscal prudence and debt management mm -hmm. and management of the central bank balance sheet, but not monetary and fiscal policy in right. the way we understand it now. So what we're what we're learning in real time is that those are products of the emergence of the macroeconomic mode of governance, which 
perdured through and was not fundamentally shaken by what we mm. think of as the supply side revolution or rational expectations. All of that happened, but it really happened within the envelope of of macro policy. And what we're yes. seeing now is a dissolution of the frame of that. I mean, one that, the bit that always has fascinated me is macro prudential regulation. Because again, you know, in the 50s, the Bank of England didn't have any inhibitions about telling Barclays what it thought, how much it thought it should be lending yeah. and under what terms. And it would directly condition its ability to do so by requiring it to hold different types of reserves in exactly the same way as the People's Bank of China does right now. And an activist form of macro prudentialism would argue that we should be doing as well, right, across the across the Western world. So mm -hmm. that these, what we're learning is that those boundaries of different types of economic policy intervention are highly institutionally specific. They've got histories, they've got ideas, as you, as someone like you would argue, they're very powerfully structured by the kind of ideas people have about economic policy. And they are up for grabs in a moment of crisis like this. Yeah, certainly seems to be. We've mentioned China, but we haven't really gone there. So let's go to China. How do you read China coming out of this? Because in a sense, they're advertising to the world that they are coming out of this, but they're coming out into a very different world. And that's got to matter for China. How do you read the whole sort of China growth project and governance project post-corona? It's a pretty stunning moment, again, because I was looking at the auto industry through this, because they seem like a good bellwether. You know, they're a little old fashioned, but nevertheless, big employer, you know, global manufacturing business, too easily underrated. You know, and it's a stunning fact about the world right now that the only factories that VW, the largest car manufacturer in the world, has open that are making cars that are being sold to actual customers are in China. Right? Right. So there is a there is a, an absolute There's a there cost. there. There's a real reality to the fact that they're coming out and everyone else is, is still it? shut right. down, right? So that's that's clearly the case. The other thing we've got to do when we do these comparisons is get our scales right, because if you're because China is the size of Europe, the United States, and everyone else put together, really, in terms of the scale of its economy, not GDP. Yes. Um, and if you look at Hubei province, Hubei province is still wrecked. I mean, Hubei's province is GDP, which is the equivalent of looking at Italy, after all, because it's about yeah. the same population. Th that's by no means recovering. But in the right. rest of the giant organism of the Chinese economy, there's a real recovery. The thing for me that's really striking, the dog that hasn't barked, is where's China's stimulus? You know, if right. you get really into the weeds, if you follow, you know, whatever Western sources that a non-Chinese speaker can follow on the PBOC, you know they're tinkering. They are, leave, you know, twiddling all the different buttons on their dashboard, and they have a lot of different buttons to manipulate the Chinese credit system. But what mm. they're not doing is saying they're not issuing one of those party directives the way they did in the fall of right. 2008, which is comrades. You know, the future of the nation is at stake. We expect you to find an investment project and report to party headquarters next week on what it is and what you're going to do about making sure it gets built in the next month. Right. That is not happening. Right. Um, that's what they did with the virus itself. I mean, that, you know, the, the lockdowns were implemented as a as a party campaign. There is no stimulus equivalent. And so what's happened, I mean, 12 years on from 08 is clearly China's a lot richer. It matters far more to the global economy. Um, it doesn't rely on exports anywhere near as, as it much as it did in 08, but it is also much more constrained. Um, mm -hmm. This is a kind of Michael Pettis theme, you know, that, that we need to look at the way in which Beijing is actually at this point hobbled by three things, basically, by the, the fragility in its financial system. They simply don't know how much they can trust the banks to do the job of acting as a flywheel. There's too much investment for too long and too much of it's unproductive. So their debt to GDP ratio is really flat to them and they know it. And the third thing is the worry, the memory of 2015, 2016, when China right. experienced, you know, one trillion dollars of outflow. And they really don't want to go back there. And the last thing the emerging market world needs as well is instability in the Chinese exchange rate. So right. for all of those reasons, you know, Beijing is, for me, the dog that hasn't barked. They've done the public health thing. So you would expect now the triumphant economic yeah. policy follow up. Not so far. Um, yeah. Very quiet to at spring week last week not banging the One Belt, One Road drum, meekly, it seems, basically going along with the rest of the G20 and doing debt relief. No strong signs of, you know, a heavy, a heavy um, unilateral Chinese grand strategic project at that moment. Yeah. So kind of a bit of a puzzle, really. So just focusing on one part of that, one bit that's always puzzled me, and you highlight it in the book, is exactly this huge amount of capital flight that comes along in 2015 that scares the bejesus out of them. If you want to live up to those geopolitical ambitions, if it's about the Asian Investment Bank, Belt and Road, etc., you need to internationalize your currency. 
But you can't do that if you have three layers of capital controls and an entire investor class that clearly signals, I'd rather be living somewhere else. So are, if they are fundamentally constrained in that way, that's got to have a kind of a knock-on effect for long-term growth and long-term investment and the role they can play usefully in the global economy, right? And on the other hand, totally granted, would we really want to see China with a fully liberalized balanced payments account? Would we really like to have seen what would have happened in 1516 if they hadn't been able to turn the tap off? I mean, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, for me, the moment that really came home, it was like The Economist, you know, The Economist magazine does like an annual roundup and they did this account of the crisis of 15. And all of a sudden you found yourself reading like the flagship organ of global liberalism celebrating, openly celebrating Beijing's capacity by means of increased regulatory uh, effort to control this, this moment of capital flight. And at that point, you realize, hang on, like these two things do not go together. So yeah. basically, it, it seems that, you know, to keep China as a steady flywheel of economic growth implies not moving forward into that world of total integration. The, 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 the story of the 1990s was incoherent. The responsible stakeholder story of the 1990s, simple convergence, was incoherent, not just at the political side. In All other right. words, getting richer was not going to make the CCP more liberal. Um, it's also potentially incoherent from the economic side. Surprise, surprise, because after all, liberal economics is totally devoid of any incoherence. No, um, Absolutely. It, it, it's incoherent because, in fact, economic growth is not a steady state machine that just, you know, it just doesn't keep on giving, especially in a tumultuous environment like China. Eight percent growth per annum is not just not a formula for mm. political liberalism. It's also not a formula for financial stability. And if it's not a formula for financial stability, then you need all hands on deck. You know, right. you, you need, and the BIS is underwritten this. I mean, this the annual report they put out last year, the BIS annual report, is a document, I think, that will go down in history because it basically says to all other EMs, by all means financially integrate, but if you do, you need reserve capacity. You need a large exchange reserve. You need to be able to do deep macro prudential regulatory interventions in the balance sheets of private actors big enough to destabilize your economy. And yes, you need to be willing to contemplate capital controls to stem massive destabilizing outflows. Otherwise, right. the trade-offs are just not good enough. And you know, that's we're no longer, we're problem. not in Kansas, right? That's we are not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. It's true for Thailand, I mean, like Thailand is basically a local problem for Thailand. If, mm -hmm. if, if it's true for Thailand, it's clearly in aggregate true. The United States needs the PBOC to not be a mirror image of the Fed. Yes. And all of which relicenses that kind of dollar flow that we were highlighting earlier. Because if there is no other competitor, then you're stuck with it. And simply by being, if you will, the liquidity and the furniture, that gives the United States the structural power to just continue to behave as badly as it wants and then bail everyone out. Exactly, because it allows other people to behave as badly as they like, which is the private actors in China. I mean, you know, because they will gorge the, the, the you know, the immense, the over-leveraged Chinese real estate developers. Well, of course, Evergrande is the, like, everyone's, I think, right. disaster waiting to happen. That's over $100 billion worth of foreign currency denominated debt. <laughs> that clearly yeah. is. You just, don't want that you know, going south. No, I mean, that's that's just Jenga, basically. I mean, people yes. have pulled bits out all the way up. And at some point, you know, it's like mega Jenga. But that's also enabled by this, right? And and, right. and so there is indeed like a weirdly mutually reinforcing and, and inequalities. You know, Michael Pettis and Matt Klein have this book on its way out into this moment right now, which traces this all back to quest structures of inequality. I mean, in a sense, a classic liberalism mm -hmm. theme, Hobson, you know, articulated yeah. this, that that if you have massive inequalities of wealth and income, then you will have patterns of demand, which are not, if you like, self-satisfied. They do not stabilize a national economy. And then you end up in these networks of interdependence. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just in closing then, globalization, it was already not in retreat, but being reconfigured. We're not going to completely deglobalize. A reemergent of a kind of economic nationalism doesn't necessarily foretell autarky by any means. But the, the virus has shown us to be frighteningly interdependent. Is there a way in which the experience of the virus protects globalization or undermines it? I mean, you're singing my music. That, that's exactly how I would have put it. I mean, historians, you know, argue about the emergence of a global condition in the 19th century, which is the state, if you write, almost the state of mind, but it's much thicker than mm -hmm. that. We are yeah. all 
the frontier is closed. We're on one planet. We're not actually already on a satellite watching us as a planet, but we understand ourselves in that closed way. So that means, you know, talk about deglobalization will be almost North Korea. <laughs> every, every other condition, including the Cold War, implied, of course, an acute awareness of the presence of the other, um, which was a form of globalization. So that it's, it's all about reconfiguration. And I agree that the virus is, in fact, very ambiguous in its effects. On the one hand, we've seen, you know, we're, we've actually internalized it, you know, in a sense, because we're shut in our houses, we're not even noticing the fact that we simply can't cross international borders anymore. I mean, yeah. literally, not. I've got friends can't do who are trapped, like Italians yeah. who don't have residences in Italy, who were visiting people in Australia, who were sent back to Italy willy nilly, because that's the only place their passport will actually gain them access anymore. I mean, it's, I mean, they literally have nowhere to live in Italy, yeah. but that's the only place they can go. So it's, it, it's been spectacularly damaging at that level. But at the other hand, it, it is, as you say, I mean, you know, Macron, that, that interview in the FT, I mean, if you can gain access to the transcript, everyone should read it because it's so, I mean, on the one hand, you know, the guy has got more brain power than your average head of state. And on the other hand, it's real Stanley Kubrick style, you know, <laughs> Dr. Strangelove at moments. But he does have this phrase about like anthropology, that this is an anthropological experience when yeah. ever previously in history has such a cross section of humanity, literally from you and me to street hawkers in Delhi, like and yeah. in Lagos and in Durban, have all essentially been shocked by the same thing at the same moment. You know, yeah. Obviously in very di radically different ways with hugely different implications, but we share this moment. Everyone in the world will be able to say, what were you doing during the corona epidemic? Yeah. Literally everyone on the planet, that's unprecedented and astonishingly virtually every government in the world has reacted in some rather dramatic way and the ones that haven't have now labeled themselves as kind of corona pariahs because mm -hmm. you know the bolsonaros and so on and, and are playing that game which is itself so anyway i i agree i think because i was previously thinking about climate change it isn't really it, it this just drives home that but it warps right back. in other words whether we like it or not and whether our political systems can process it Yes, we are massively interconnected. The thing about climate change is, as Bruno Latour made this point in, in an editorial, you know, there isn't a, there is literally no national answer to the global threat of climate change. There's nothing right. you can do nationally that will make any difference. The perverse thing about COVID-19 is that though it is a massive global threat, there is the sense that through local solutions, we can protect ourselves, at least temporarily. Yeah not restore a viable mode of life, but protect ourselves temporarily. And that that has a retrograde logic that climate change is just paradigm busting because yeah. there's no alternative to acting collectively and there will be no solution that isn't collective. So, um, yeah, I think I think COVID is, is clearly has the potential for, to be played. And again, we've got to stress agency and ideas and all your kind of stuff. Like it has the potential to be played catastrophically in mm. the most xenophobic, nationalistic way imaginable. Um, but that's an option rather than really a yeah. structurally determined. Absolutely. I think I've had my chat. How about you? Oh, it's been great. It's been fun. It's been great. Absolutely. Did I miss you. I missed, I missed talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> so how about this? We make a promise that uh, when New York finally opens up and we're allowed, we're allowed to travel, we will pick a restaurant and we will go to it. Go to it. Let's 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 see whether we can get our risk uh, personal risk uh, tolerances aligned. <laughs> exactly. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just one dollar. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.